He is prophetically talking about the Messiah, the one that would come, the one that would lay down His life to save, save His people. If you keep reading the end of that chapter in Psalm 22, His righteous acts will be told to those not yet born. They will hear about everything that He has done. Now we're approaching uh, Valentine's Day tomorrow. I don't know, there's something going on today too, but I don't, know, I don't even know what that is. It's a football game, I think, or it was a baseball game. Which one is it? Anyway. Don't forget your sweethearts, guys, for Valentine's Day, but think about God's love each and every day and tell about Jesus' righteous acts. Because the world doesn't understand that. They don't understand why God would love them so much that He would send His one and only Son to die for them. They rely on their own righteous acts or don't even worry about it because it doesn't matter to them. But tell them about the joy that you have, the hope that you have. That's why you can say with confidence, and you can read this one with me if you want to, but I'm reading from the New Living Translation. The very next words of Scripture is, The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need, I will not want. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to His name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast before me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. See, someone who doesn't know the hope of Jesus Christ, that doesn't understand why He gave up His life, doesn't think that He even is the Son of God or whatever it is, will not understand this Scripture. And you guys all know Psalm 23. Is the Lord your shepherd? Is He guiding you through this life and into eternity? Psalm 24 the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to Him. For He laid the earth's foundations on the seas and built it on the ocean depths. Who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in His holy place? Only those whose hands, are, hands and hearts are pure, who do not worship idols and never tell lies. They will receive the Lord's blessing and have a right relationship with God their Savior. Such people may seek you and worship you in your presence, O God of Jacob. Open up ancient gates, open up ancient doors, and let the King of glory enter. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord invincible in ba battle. Open up ancient gates, open up ancient doors, and let the King of glory enter. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of heaven's armies, He is the King of glory. Continuing on in Psalm 25, if Jesus is your King, O Lord, I give my life to you, I trust in you, my God. Do not let me be disgraced or let my enemies rejoice in my defeat. No one who trusts in you will ever be disgraced, but disgrace comes to those who try to deceive others. Show me the right path, O Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. Lead me by your truth and teach me, for you are the God who saves me. All the day long I will put my hope in you. Now Psalm, 23, Psalm 22 started with, J with David talking about his suffering. As you see, it quickly turned to Jesus and His suffering so that our light and momentary sufferings on this earth won't mean anything because we know that God is with us. He'll never forsake us. He forsook Jesus Christ, His Son, on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins. Does that make Jesus your shepherd? Does it make Him your King? Does it make Him your Lord? If so, you will follow in His path. You will fix your eyes on Him. You will love the Lord your God with everything that you have, and you'll be a light to this world because you can't help being anything else. Are you following after Jesus? Is He your King? So what about that great commission you read about this week, right? Not a great suggestion or anything, but a great commission. You have been commissioned to do this. And have you ever wondered why Galilee's not in there? I mean, where does it say go? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then to the rest of the world, right? The far ends of the earth. Why is Galilee not in there? Isn't that part of the lost kingdom of Israel or the divided kingdom of Israel, or however you want to put it? But as you've been reading through Matthew, if you notice, Jesus' ministry began in Galilee. 
Matthew's first sermon recorded was Jesus on a mountainside in Galilee, the Sermon on the Mount. It wasn't his first sermon, that's just where Matthew wrote about. And if you notice, his, his sermons ended in Galilee on a mountain. Galilee's there. They're part of the tribe of, of Israel. It's part of the Great Commission, and that's where Jesus spent his time preaching. Because so many times, like in Jerusalem, we think we're righteous and don't know that we need a Savior. And I say that today so that you realize that no matter how much you've been to church, no matter how much you read your Bible, no matter how many acts of kindness, if Jesus is not your Lord, He is not your Savior. If He is not shepherding you and leading you, then you're not going in the right way. Pretty simple. Is Jesus your King? Now I'm going to give you three questions to think about. <clears throat> How do you feel about the poor? Because we read about them in these scriptures. Honestly, because I guarantee you at some point in your thinking process, some point in your life, and maybe you're past that and you don't think that anymore because you are progressing to be more like Christ, but you thought, well, the poor are that way because they do this or that, or they don't do this or that. There are none righteous, no, not one. No one deserves God's love, His mercy, and His grace. And Jesus tells us to preach the gospel to the poor. In fact, when John the Baptist was questioning him, he sent out his followers, his disciples, and asked Jesus, and Jesus said, the gospel is being preached to the poor, to those who are needy, to those who have less. And so many times in this world we get content, we have idols, if you want to call them that, because of all the things that we have, all the created things that were designed to bring us blessing, and we tend to focus on them instead of on the Creator who created them all. How do you feel about thieves? We, mentioned, we find a mention of one of these thieves in the, the scriptures that we read this, this week. Oh, you can have a little bit more judgment there or a little bit of whatever you want to call it because they did something that deserves judgment, right? That deserves the penalty of whatever the crime is. Don't we all? That's chapter 26 because the poor are mentioned there. Chapter 27, a thief is mentioned. Chapter 28... If you're Jesus' disciple, then he'll give you some final instructions and he'll say, go. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I am the King of kings, the Lord of lords. I am the reason for your existence, everything else, especially the reason if you believe that you have eternal life, that you're saved from eternal damnation. Therefore, go and make disciples. Are you doing that? telling about Jesus, and then training up those who say that they believe so that they will not depart from it. Because we fight a spiritual battle and Satan is trying to devour whomever he can. So here's the third question. How do you feel about someone who says one thing but then does something else? That word is a hypocrite. It's all throughout the Bible, isn't it? But, if I want to be honest, that word applies to me a lot in my life. Whether you be honest or not, it's up to you. Is Jesus really your king then? That doesn't mean you won't do anything wrong. Look at the example of David. Look at Paul. We're getting into Paul in Acts chapter 9. And he said, why do I continue to do the things that I do not want to do? But he also said for him to live is to die so that he can live for Christ. He says that if he dies, it's gain for him, but he has a mission still to accomplish here. So we're going to review Matthew's gospel real quickly. We're not going to get into Mark today. We'll get into it next week. Where did Jesus' ministry begin? I gave you that answer already. Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. When Jesus heard that John had been imprisoned, he withdrew to Galilee. That's where he began teaching according to Matthew's gospel. Not that the gospel is wrong. That's just where Matthew picks up the story. This is how he's presenting this. Jesus is preaching in Galilee. Where did it end in Matthew's gospel? Matthew 28, verse 10. Do not be afraid, Jesus said. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. Those instructions are given in Galilee of how to live. Remember how the Sermon on the Mount starts? Blessed are... These things that we don't think are blessings at all. But Jesus says they are blessings. 
Blessed are you when? I'll let you go back and fill in the blanks. <clears throat> what did Jesus begin his ministry teaching? We'll go back to Matthew 7 and read verse 17. From that time on, Jesus preached, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. If you didn't get it, John taught the same thing. Repent. You have got to change the way you think so that it changes your heart, so that it changes your behavior. You can't go on thinking the same way. I'm a righteous person. I'm rich. I have need of nothing. I'm not a thief. I've not done the things that these people have done. Whatever it is that you th your thought process is before, or simply you thought, I will do everything I can for the kingdom, but you don't have a relationship with the king. It's about that loving relationship that you have with Jesus Christ all because you believed that He's who He said He is, that He did what He said He's going to do, and He will continue to do it. He will never, ever forsake you. Greater things you will do when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then going back to Matthew chapter 28, how did Jesus' teachings end? All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore, you will live what I have taught. All in between those chapters are Jesus' teachings. You read them. You read all of the, the miracles that he did, all the teachings that he, that he taught. Do you believe them? Do you live them? In Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, a couple verses after 17, Jesus said, Come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. That's what you are to be. The gospel of Matthew is clearly presented. If you follow after Jesus, which means the same word means that you have to forsake the other, you have to turn away from what you were following, turn around and follow Jesus, then he will make you a fisher of men. Now there are no guarantees right here of who's going to be saved or who's not going to be saved, but if you follow after Jesus, he says he'll make you a fisher of men. There will be results. I don't know about you, but that's worth it if there's one result in your life. One catch especially someone that close to you, a child, a grandchild, whatever, that you give your life. Would you give your life to save them? Jesus gave his life to save you as someone who's poor, wretched, blind, a thief, a murderer, because there are none righteous, no, not one. After all of Jesus' teachings, his miracles, his passion, his resurrection, no ascension yet because Matthew doesn't write about that, his last teaching was a commission. Since all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus, verse 19 of Matthew 28, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. You're not going to teach them if you're not doing it. And surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You do not have to worry about Jesus forsaking you, Him not being with you. He is in your hearts. He is in your minds. He dwells with you through the Spirit, if you, in fact, are a Christian, if you believe. These teachings, as we saw through the book of Matthew, are about the teachings of the kingdom of heaven. Do you belong to the kingdom of heaven? Are you a child of the kingdom of heaven? They began on a mountain in Galilee. Jesus taught how believers will live for the kingdom of heaven, what that looks like. You could spend a long time going through just over the Sermon on the Mount and looking at what all Jesus taught. And if you look at it and examine it to what you used to think before you believed, it's quite a contrast. So you've got to fill yourself with the Spirit once you fix your eyes and believe in Jesus, fix your eyes on Him, so that all of these things will become distant, remote. You won't long for these things anymore. They'll be foreign to you. Matthew chapter 4, verse 25, reading on to 5, 2, we'll read straight through. The large crowds that followed Him came from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, and we have the words of the Sermon on the Mount. Is Jesus teaching you? Are you learning? 
Have you come to Him to find the truth? Because without the truth, you won't know the way and you won't have eternal life. Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The last, commission, the last words were the commission. But Jesus told us before that in verse, 20, in verse 10 of chapter 28, Do not be afraid. Go to Galilee and there you will see me. Where those teachings started, Jesus told them not to fear, not to be afraid, because he would be leaving and they had nothing to fear because he wouldn't be leaving them. He would be with them forever. Is Jesus really your king? Or do you still have fears and apprehensions? Do you still have other gods before Jehovah God? The problem is not so much doubt in the church, it's lack of obedience in the church. Because if you ask most any Christian, do they believe, they don't doubt that they believe. But is there evidence of that? Is their heart right with Jesus? Does He mean more than anything to you? And are you willing to give up to live for Him? He gave up everything to die for you. In Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20, it says, Meanwhile, the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain Jesus had designated. When they saw Him, they worshipped Him, but some doubted. Doubting is not the problem. If you doubt, take your prayer request to God. He wants to be known. Read His Word. He will reveal Himself to you. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, He will grow it into the biggest of the garden variety plants. If you have faith, don't doubt. Turn that doubt into belief. And then act upon it. Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples. Teach them to obey. All the way to the ends of the earth. And I am with you. I will never forsake you. It's the commission of the church. But honestly, let's be serious about it. The body of Christ thinks it's for a select few so many times. What do I mean by that? Take an average congregation and ask them, are you preaching the gospel message? Well, I'm not really equipped for that. It's not my calling. It's Jesus' calling, and that's why we've been going through Acts, for everyone who believes, not for a select few, but for everyone to live a life that brings glory to God, a life of obedience, a life of joy, a life that tells others of the joy that you have for, for Jesus, for what He's done. Do you do that? Are you living out your commission? <clears throat> when Jesus went up on the mountainside in Matthew chapter 5, if you remember reading it, it said, when Jesus saw the crowds, the crowds, because many say, Lord, Lord. When He saw the crowds, He went up the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to Him. There was only a few that were listening. Revelation talks so many times about if you have ears, listen to what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. And those words are to the churches. Because so many hear but don't obey. They say they're listening, but it goes in one ear and out the other. Because there's no acts of obedience. There's no loving acts. Therefore, they're not fishing for men. Let me remind you what the church looked like in Acts chapter 2. Verse 42 to 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. A sense of awe came over everyone because this was something that they were not accustomed to. The apostles performed many wonders and signs. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they shared with anyone who was in need. There was no thought about whether the poor deserved it or not at that point, was there? With one accord, they continued to meet daily in the temple courts to break bread from house to house, sharing their meals with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily to those who were being saved. But as we read through the book of Acts, we know that threats of persecution came. 
So in Acts chapter 4, Luke reminds us again what the church looks like. Verse 42, uh, 32, The multitude of believers was one in heart and one in soul. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they owned. With great power, that all became power. With great power, the apostles continued to give their testimony about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And abundant grace was upon them all. There were no needy among them. We went from people who had need to no needy. Because those who owned land or houses sold their property, bringing the proceeds from the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet for distribution to anyone who had need. So I asked you these questions earlier. How do you feel about the poor? And I'm not here to point fingers. I, I just know that there is some judgmental parts there. And I could use different people, but I used three examples, like I said, that we see in Matthew chapter 26, 27, 28, with the point being the example of us following the commission or not. How do you feel about the poor? If Jesus really is your king, then poor and needy should be a very important thing to you. You should want to stamp out the injustice of this life, those that have need, regardless of what the need is. I'm not talking Christian communism where everything's the same and we've got to share it and we're forced to. That's not what heaven is. Heaven is I love someone so much that I don't want them to be in need. That I care about them. I don't care why they got there how they got there. I care that they're there. Do you see the implications of the lost? Why would I care about what this person did or didn't do? I should care about their soul spending eternity in hell versus me giving them the light, telling them about Jesus, living a life of love so that they can leave that state that they're in and find peace and joy in Jesus being their Lord and shepherd where they have no want, even though the want in this earth may still look the same way but they know they have no want because Jesus will fill all of their needs eternally. The disciples may have realized this fact earlier. They may not. Matthew chapter 26. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of expensive perfume which she poured on his head as he reclined at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. They were furious with this. And they said, why this waste? This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Looks like they care about the poor, doesn't it? Looks like they care about the poor. They knew they'd been taught that. Read through the Old Testament and see about the teachings of the poor. But was their heart really focused on the poor here? I don't know. I'm not casting stones. But it doesn't seem to be a heart passion here. Because in Acts we see them doing for the poor. We see that it becomes such a job for the twelve that they have to get lay people to handle that job. Stephen, F Philip. Here we see a statement. I'm a Christian, but do I live like Christ? Do I have a desire to alleviate the injustice of the poor? Do I have a desire to bring thieves to salvation? Am I living out the Great Commission? And I say it like that again, so I say to myself, I can't live out the Great Commission and not have care for the poor or for those that are guilty of crimes. I can't just have compassion for those who seem like they're righteous. I need to have compassion for everyone because I am that person. I was blind, but now I see. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was poor. I thought I was rich. I was naked. And Jesus fed me and clothed me and gave me sight so that I could tell everyone of His gracious, abundant, unfailing love. Jesus asked them, aware of this, it says. So that's why I think a little bit there's a little haughtiness in their heart or whatever. Jesus said, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful deed. The poor will always have you, but you will not always have me. The poor will always have you, and it's their 
need and your obligation as a follower of Jesus Christ to go to them, to have the food programs, to love them, to pray for them. Whatever it is that God's calling you to do, not to be judgmental towards them. Jesus was not denying the poor here. In fact, He was saying it's going to be something that you're going to have to take care of in this world. In heaven, this will be taken care of. But in this world, you're supposed to be like me. And remember what I told you that Jesus said to John's disciples. The poor hear the gospel. They're not going to hear the gospel again if you refuse to go around them or if you think you're better than them and say, well, I'll give you some bread if you come to church or whatever. You give them bread because you have a desire to feed them. You give them spiritual bread because they're on your heart because they are a human being created in God's image. And you've been blessed with the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Those things have been revealed to you that have not been revealed to others. Will you share them? So how do you feel about a thief, right? There were two of them crucified with Jesus, right? Matthew 27 says this, Two robbers were crucified, I'm in verse 38, were crucified with him, one on his right hand and the other on his left. And those who passed by heaped abuse on him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you're the Son of God, come down from that cross. In the same way, the chief priests, scribes, and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others, but he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, <clears throat> if he wants him. For he said, I am the Son of God. In the same way, even the robbers who were cru crucified berated him. Those guilty of crimes... Now, if you didn't go to another gospel, you don't get the rest of the story of the thieves because there's nothing here but mention. But if you did catch one thief's on the right hand, remember that parable about the sheep and goats and on the right? I don't know if Dismas was the one on the right or not. That's what tradition is given to his name. He's the repentative thief. And tradition has it he's on the right of Jesus. You know what tradition also says? Tradition also says that he was one of the people who robbed Joseph and Mary on their way to Egypt and stole the, the frank, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I don't know if that's true or not. But if anybody didn't des deserve forgiveness, it was that guy. Right? But if you go to Luke, <clears throat> you know what Jesus said. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. What's the difference in the two thieves? The one thief recognized who Jesus is and said, remember me. That shows that I'm asking for forgiveness. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. So if you want Jesus to remember you when he comes into your kingdom, didn't he say repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand now? Shouldn't we be living a life like that now? Didn't He give us all authority in heaven? Didn't He give us power to live by the Holy Spirit living in us? We are a royal priesthood. We, we don't have to have a priest to go to. We have direct access to God the Father because of Jesus Christ the Son and His Spirit that dwells in us. So are you living that way? Chapter 28, the task at hand is, will my followers, will the church live out this commission that I give them? Or will, be, will they be those that honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me? Are you a genuine believer or are you a hypocrite? I'm not pointing fingers. I'm just getting you to think about, is Jesus really, truly your king? Because if he's not, he might not be your savior. Is He Lord of everything? Because if He's not a Lord of everything, then there are places where He's not Lord. And that means He's not Lord at all. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus sends out His disciples for the first time. All this is structured in the book of Matthew, because that's what we read. In chapter 9, though, 
In the closing, we read this in verse 35. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness for the thieves and the poor as well as the righteous, probably even more so. And as we read in Acts, we see those things continued with the disciples. When he saw the crowds, and we even see they continued with, with Philip. When he saw the crowds, he was moved with compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. I will not be in want. He is the one who guides me. He's the one that brings me to pastures and cool waters. He's the one that anoints my head with oil. Is he your shepherd? Verse 37, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Something's distorted there. If there's a huge harvest field, but there's not many workers, why? Except there are few who claim to be workers or servants who actually work. Ask the Lord of harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest. Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 through 8. Do not go onto the road of the Gentiles or enter into the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. But we see the commission changes all that, don't we? As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Now Matthew uses the terminology here that the kingdom of heaven is near which means it's coming upon, it is here, but it's also near because when Jesus gives the commission, He's saying that the kingdom is here. Are you living as kingdom children? He's not training you anymore. He has commissioned you to go out and do all that He has trained you to do, all that He has taught you to do, if you have truly forsaken everything else and followed after Him. And in verse 42 of Matthew chapter 10, it says, If anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of the little, these little ones, because he is my disciple, truly I tell you, he will never lose his reward. And that's echoed in the, the parable that we read of Jesus' last teachings, last parable, where the righteous were divided from the unrighteous, the sheep from the goats, one placed on the right, the others placed on the left, the ones on the right given eternal life. The ones on the left given eternal dar darkness, eternal death. There was weeping and gnashing of teeth. And the difference, Jesus said, is basically the same thing He said here because you gave a cup of water to the least of these. When you did that, you gave it to me. Do you see all of Jesus' teachings? Is it wrapping together as you read the Gospel of Matthew? which started on a mountain in Galilee teaching those who would hear, those few, even though many were there, and ended on a mountain in Galilee teaching those few that would hear and obey. And the church was born from that. And the church continues because of that. <clears throat> Do you believe Jesus? Are you following Him? Do you have compassion or even a passion for the least of these, for the thieves and those that have wronged you? Are you living out the Great Commission? I told you last week that you should be able to see a progression in your life if you look back. I challenge you to examine and see if you have. Because you, if you're walking in the paths of righteousness, you should be able to see over time the fact that you're becoming more like Christ. Others should be able to see it. That's the reason Peter goes on to write, because of the hope that you have, people see that and ask you. They will go out of their way to ask you because they see Jesus Christ in you. But unless you are progressing to that, they're not going to see it. No greater love a man have but to lay down his life for his friends. Remember those words that Jesus taught in John chapter 12, uh, 13, I think. I may be wrong. As we approach Valentine's Day and you think about love, think about 
God's love. And how much that He loved you that He would give His Son for you. How are you giving and showing that love back to Him? We're going to take part in communion today. And Jesus told us to do that in remembrance of Him. You can come if you want to come, but I will challenge you just like Paul did to make sure that you come accordingly. You are partaking part in remembrance of Jesus, not His physical body or blood, but a representation that Jesus gave His body for you. In Psalm 22, David wrote that his, Jesus could count His bones.